time, we come together to know that this is a safe place for everyone. And we have quite a few guests this morning. Some are just visiting, but some have come because we have a special thing that we did out of our churches this morning called baptism. And our person who's going to be baptized is talking to us right now. <laughs> So we are glad that you are here this morning. We are so glad that you chose this. You know, I say this almost every I'm one of the whole world, by the way, pastor of this church. One of the great churches there. And you know, like our times are so busy, so packed with things to do that a lot of times I say this and I mean this. So this is a, a time to put aside all the fears in your life that you worry about. You can put those up on the other side of the service. But for now, take a deep breath, a deep, cozy breath, and know that you are the one that God. That you are cherished for what you do with God. So welcome this Sunday morning.
Christ. Through the baptism, the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation, and we are given new birth through water and spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. Who comes for baptism today? We do. No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? And if so, say, we do. We do. Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and opposition, oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And if so, say, we do. We do. You confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to peoples of all ages, nations, and races. And if so, say, we do. We do. Will you nurture Reese Robert in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to process his faith openly and to lead a Christian life. And if so, say we will. We will. And so now I speak to all of you. So you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. And if so, say we do. We do. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include Reese Robert now before you? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround the resolver with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow into service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who will walk in the way of peace of life. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Son, for our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified,
lover. He was so good. I had babies scream and scream and scream. <laughs> which just, like sets me off and I'm like, well, God, help me get to this prayer. <laughs> so we had a great baby. And I'm so glad that all of you got to be part, not as witnesses, but as participants in this Prayer is our communication to God. And I don't know if you realize that God's first language is silence. So many times we pray, and a lot of us sometimes have a long list. So we pray for this, and we want this, and we pray for this, and we pray for our friends, and we just keep talking and talking and talking. And it's only when we pause and in the silence that God can speak to us. And so, if you haven't already today, I invite you at some point today to have some time with God and it's just silence on your part and see if the Holy Spirit will speak to you. So let us go to God in an attitude of prayer. Creator, Redeemer, lover of us, we come to you this morning with hearts filled with joy. It is such a joy that we can baptize such an infant into your mighty church and into your mighty works of salvation. We thank you for the opportunity that we get to participate in the baptism of Reese Robert. We thank you for our very lives, for all that you have given us. We thank you for the people that surround us with love and with care. We thank you that we live in a country where we have many, many freedoms. And at the same time, while we're giving praise and thanksgiving for all that is in our lives, we know that on the other side, there are so many sorrows. And today we lift those who are grieving somebody who has been lost recently. We pray for those with an illness that requires being in the hospital. We pray for those who have recently contracted COVID. We pray for those who suffer from ailments that we don't always see. Those that suffer from emotional or mental problems, depression. There are people with bipolar disease. There are people who have so many issues. Let them find a safe place here and share those problems that we can support them. We can't take the place of therapists and doctors who can help them, but we are here to listen to show compassion, to give them support that they need. We pray especially for those who feel so far away from you, Lord. For you are always with us, and yet sometimes we feel so lost and alone. Help us to find you again. And while we have our own individual problems that are such a great concern to you, we know there are people around the world suffering. The war in Ukraine seems endless. Help us to find a solution to end that war, not just to keep the fighting going on. But we know that you want peace. We pray for those in this country who are suffering from very high heat and temperatures. Let them find shade and comfort inside. We pray for others around the world who live in daily violence, where you call us to have peace and non-violence. We pray for those who are still grieving the loss of loved ones from gun violence in this country. Help us to find solutions 
before the next one happens, the permanent solutions. We thank you for Jesus, who is our teacher, our savior, our healer. And he taught us the prayer that we join our voices in today by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
While he was speaking, some people came from the synagogue's leader house to say, Your daughter's dead. Why don't you want the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion. People weeping and wailing loudly. <clears throat> when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make such a commotion and weep? The child's not dead. She's just sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put all, them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with them and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, kill her. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this work, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. That was the rest of the story. <laughs> I, I dated myself. <laughs> Frank Rogers, in his book called Practicing Compassion, begins the very first sentence says, Compassion is the heartbeat of humanity. is the heartbeat of humanity. And he continues, and he says, we are most fully human. We are most fully ourselves when we see someone in the truth of his or her experience and respond with kindness and care. Think about that. Compassion, the heartbeat of humanity, and compassion is when we are most fully human, most fully ourselves, when we see somebody in the truth of his or her experience. That means we don't deny what is happening. We don't say, oh, that's not real. We see them in their suffering. And we respond with kindness and care. Today we begin a four-part sermon series on compassion. We all like to think of ourselves as compassionate people. Every one of us. And we are. We really are. When we see somebody that we care about hurting, we want to be there with them. We want to listen to them. We want to help them any way we can. It is human nature to be with those who are hurting those that we love and we care about. It is easy to be compassionate in those circumstances. But there's a lot of times when we fall short of being compassionate. I have to tell you, I turn on the news and I see some of the people on the news, and I really struggle to find some compassion in me you know, there's lots of reasons why we aren't compassionate. Sometimes we see somebody or we walk by somebody or drive by somebody and we don't see them. We don't see that they're suffering because we're too busy with our own thoughts and our own lives. Sometimes we don't want to show that we're compassionate because we think that makes us vulnerable. And further, we think if we're vulnerable, that makes us weak. And the last thing anybody in this culture wants to be is weak. We know that's not true, but it is the perception of a lot of people that if you're vulnerable, you're weak. And only, only the strong win. Only the good really win. Sometimes, if it's somebody we disagree with, we might even say something like, well, they deserve to suffer. Let me not be compassionate to that person because they don't deserve compassion. We think it's something that they deserve. It's difficult to be compassionate. It is difficult to be compassionate. And yet, we are called disciples of Jesus, 
And Jesus calls us to be compassionate to everyone. Jesus is countercultural because in our culture today, lots of times we talk about us and them. And that's not what Jesus did. Jesus said, come, you're all included. And so for us, we need to include everybody and include everybody in that circle where we give compassion. Scientists tell us that compassion is good for us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. It is good. It benefits us. Now, if you look up compassion in the dictionary, you might find a saying that says something like, it's to have pity and concern for people who are suffering. And that's true. But when we look to the Bible for a definition of compassion, we get more than that. It's not only to have pity and concern for the people who are suffering, but it is to act. It is to do something about it. When Jesus has compassion for the people surrounding him, he doesn't just feel with them. He acts to help them. That's what we're called to do, to act in some manner. It's easy to see where the word compassion comes from. The word passion comes from the Latin passio, and cum means with. So with Suffering. Passion means suffering. We think of passion as kind of love and everything, but passion actually means suffering. So with suffering or suffering with Jesus, suffered with. If you even go deeper, the Gospel of Mark, where our story comes from today, was first written in Greek. And Greek is even more graphic than Latin about the suffering. Compassion in the Greek means to feel for that person and want to act for that person in your stomach, in your bowels, in your gut. So Jesus not only felt an emotion for them, he felt their pain in his body. He felt it in his gut. I would be willing to say that almost every one of you in here has had a gut reaction something, a feeling in your gut, you know what that's like. Jesus had that a lot with the people around him. There's one other word that we need to talk just briefly about, and that's empathy. <clears throat> empathy is really close to compassion. Empathy means to have that care and concern for somebody who is suffering. We empathize with somebody. We share their feelings. And especially when we are dealing with somebody who suffers like the same incident that we have suffered, we really feel their feelings. But empathy stops there. Compassion takes one step back from those emotions and then does something to try to alleviate that suffering. Does something to act on that suffering. Scientists tell us that at the heart of every person, the core of every person, is compassion. The core of every person. Now, lots of people in life have experiences, you know, abuse as a child, that cause that core of compassion to be buried so deep that it's often hard to see. So when you meet somebody who's angry on the outside, try to remember that they have a compassionate core just like you. But it's buried. It's been buried by the experience they have. And scientists will also tell us that the best way to emerge again that compassionate core is to show them compassion. I don't know about you, but that's really hard for me. When I see somebody that's really angry, the first thing I want to do is get away from them. 
I don't want to get anywhere near it. Because I don't know what that anger will mean or what action it will take. But scientists, Jesus, authors of compassion books will tell us the best thing you can do is to show them compassion. What a challenge. What a challenge. Scientists also tell us that whatever level of compassion we have, we can deepen that. We can improve the compassion we have toward others. And I'm going to talk further about that in the very last sermon. But I should mention today two authors of well-known compassion books. The first is Joyce Brock. And she wrote this book called Boundless Compassion. In her book, she says there are four essential things about having compassion. The first is non-judgment. You know how difficult that is not to judge? Yeah. I mean, we judge all the time. But she says to really have compassion you learn to step away from that judgment. The second is non-violence. The third is kindness. And the fourth is mindfulness. I'm going to deal more with all four of those the last week. The other person that I already mentioned was Frank Rogers, and he wrote this book called Practicing Compassion. And he tells you how how to become more compassionate. And he says, lots of times we get into a situation and we don't feel very compassionate. We feel like, you know, somebody said something and we go, that's wrong. They're lying about that. The last thing we feel is compassion. And yet we're supposed to feel compassion. So he says, when you're in a situation like that, the first thing you do is you pause. And you take a couple of deep breaths. You know, I did that at the beginning of the service. The reason that you take a couple of deep breaths, breathe in and hold it for a moment and let it go, is because by doing a couple of deep breaths, you center yourself. I guarantee this will work. I guarantee it. And if it doesn't, you can email me. And let me know. <laughs> if you're ever anxious about something, if you're ever like just dealing with something, if you want to lower that anxiety a little bit, lower that stress that you're at, stop. Take at least three deep breaths, hold them, and let them out. And in three breaths, you will be a little more calm. It may not do away with the anxiety. It may not totally get back to normal, but it will help. I guarantee you, it will help. Our breathing, you heard of the baptism liturgy, breathing, breath, God breathed into us the breath of life. And that breath is so instrumental in our being, and our breath is what will help us become calm. So Mike says the first thing you do is stop and take a breath. Then what you do is start paying attention. Paying attention to what's going on inside of you, and you've got to pay attention to what's going on inside of the other person. And then you have to, to um, understand with empathy what is happening. You have to form a loving connection. You have to see the sacredness, and then you act. And he spent some time talking about action. Because sometimes when we think we're being compassionate, we act inappropriately. We act not for the benefit of the person or the group. We act in ways that are inappropriate. So years and years ago, before I became a pastor, I thought I was going to be a missionary. And I thought I was going to travel to Africa or some great place. You know what? God never called me to do that. I wanted to show compassion 
But God instead had me on a different path. I've told you about my dad being an alcoholic. You know, my mother never admitted that he was alcoholic. My mother, even after he died, said he could stop any time he wanted. And so she continued buying an alcohol. Did that benefit health? No. Did that benefit my family? No. But we act in what we think is a compassionate manner, but it's not. We need to be compassionate and we need to act in appropriate manners. Let me give you a little a story that I came across that's a little less dramatic than dealing with somebody who's alcoholic. So this priest is walking down this street and it's lined with old Victorian houses. And he sees a little boy at one of the houses who's trying to ring the doorbell. And the doorbell's pretty high and the little boy's low. And the little boy is jumping up and jumping up and he can't quite reach the doorbell. So this compassion sees, this, this uh, priest sees this little boy and he has compassion for him. Oh, he's suffering because he can't reach it. You know, he's hurting, he needs, he needs to get up there. I'm going to go help him. So he walks up to the little boy and, he's, and he puts his one hand on the shoulder and with the other hand he's ringing the doorbell. You know, and he's thinking, I'm doing a great thing. I'm acting, you know, trying to leave this person's problems. He can't ring the doorbell. And so he looks down at the little boy and he says, now what do we do? And the little boy looks up at him and says, we run like hell. <laughs> I didn't even make 
you know, my feet were on the ground because the crowd was just moving me along. So Jesus is being pushed by this crowd. Jesus is feeling the crowd all around him. And yet, he stops because he feels one touch that's different from all the others. And it turns out there's a woman in the crowd. She's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. So, she's a woman which doesn't have great status. She's alone. That means she has no family to protect her. And in the society of Jesus of that day, if you're a woman alone, you have no status, no standing. You are just too bad. She has been hemorrhaging, bleeding for 12 years. And in the Jewish culture, that means she can't go to a sanctuary. She can't go to a temple. She can't be in any holy places. She can't do any of the rituals. She is unclean for 12 years. She's been an outcast. At one point, we know she had some resources, but she went to doctors and she got treatments for 12 years, and none of them helped. Can you imagine having an illness for 12 years and you try every doctor, you try everything. It drains all your resources and you have nothing to show for it. Awful. Terrible. It's no wonder she doesn't want to approach Jesus like Juris did. She's the lowest of the low. So what does she want to do? She wants to sit in and see if she can. And she does. Well, he immediately senses that touch. It's different from all the other touches. Who touched him? You hear the disciples. What do you mean who touched you? There's lots of people touching you. No, this is different. And so she knows he's talking to her. And she comes and asks him the whole story. And Jesus says to her, your faith has made you well. You're a daughter of Israel. And that doesn't mean just physically he healed her. He healed her status. She is clean now. She can be part of the community again. This woman has been How wonderful. How wonderful. And so in the midst of this celebration, um, a healing that is so good, they again start to Jairus' house. And what do you know? A messenger comes and says, I'm sorry, your daughter has died. A lot of people thought that for Jesus, death was a barrier. He had been really useful to this woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, but there was nothing he could do for this little girl. She's already dead. So they start again, and he gets rid of a lot of the crowds. He takes Peter and James and John with him. They go to the house, and outside the house, people are already mourning. And mourning in those days was loud wailing and weeping, and you know, like we kind of cry and touch our cheeks and maybe a little bit of sound, but not a lot of sound. But those days, it was loud.
so Jesus asked us as his disciples to be compassionate, not just to those who are alive. Thank you. 